Kensington, Birmingham, whether you're at home or in person, why don't you stand up today and we're going to sing some praises to the Lord.
morning we are going to be learning a new song together that is all about the kingdom of God as Jesus modeled it for us. His kingdom is humble and gentle and generous and often feels backwards or upside down to what this world says is successful or powerful. In his kingdom, the last become first, and those who mourn, he calls blessed because they receive the comfort of God. And in this song, the chorus says this simple prayer, may we live and breathe your praise. And what that means, may we live and breathe God's praise, is that we would surrender our kingdoms for his kingdom. And this week, as I've been listening to this song, the whole song paints this beautiful picture of what God's kingdom really looks like. And there's been one lyric in particular that's been standing out to me that says, we want to see people the way Jesus does. We want to see people the way Jesus does. And I've been thinking about Jesus' life and how so often he moved towards people that were considered outcasts, unclean, unworthy, maybe even just simply ordinary. And he moved towards them with love. And he saw them and he affirmed their intrinsic worth and value, the imago day in them. And he gave them a place to be welcomed, to belong, and to contribute to his kingdom. And I want to see people that way. I want to see them just like Jesus did. And I want to move towards them with love just like Jesus did. So as we sing this song, I want to encourage you to just be listening really thoughtfully and singing thoughtfully through these words and consider what one God might be having stand out to you a little bit extra. And as we sing those words, may we live and breathe your praise. Let that be your prayer, that God would help you to live out that kingdom value of his in your everyday life. I'm going to teach us this chorus and then we're going to sing it together. It goes like this. Hallowed be your name, may we live and breathe your praise. Hallelujah, all creation say, oh the key.
you know, as, uh, as I was listening to the lyrics that connected with me, the one for me is your kingdom is simple. And I don't know how you feel throughout the chaos of our days, but sometimes we miss the simplicity and the significance of God's love. And even in the first song, there was this lyric that said, may you know this one truth that God is madly in love with you. He's madly in love with you. So what would it mean for us if the kingdom is so simple that we would cling to those words? Would you pray with me as we uh, get going in this day? Heavenly Father, may we come to you being reminded of how beautiful, how transformative, how powerful, and yet how simple your kingdom is that you beckon us to come near, to come close, to experience that love every single day. May we be reminded today, amidst all of the things, all the burdens that we carry, may we be reminded of your grace that meets us today, that points us back to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, so glad you're here. Before we jump into the rest of our day, why don't you say hello to somebody around you, and why don't you tell them the lyric that stuck out with you? Good morning, good morning. Welcome to Kensington. My name is Jenny and I'm on the team here at Kensington, Birmingham and I have my friend Carol up here with me. Would you just give her a little welcome? Uh-huh, uh-huh. If you like to be caffeinated during church, you may have met Carol because she serves on our coffee team. So you may have seen her out there and she's up here with me this morning. She's going to share a little bit about her experiences here at Kensington. But before we get to that, uh, we just want to say welcome, whether you are here in the room with us or joining us online. Uh, we're just so thankful to be able to gather with you and worship this morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here. And I just wanted to say to anybody who's visiting or new, I'd like to welcome you and also invite you to visit our hub in the lobby after the service. There's a great team of people wearing bright orange shirts who would love to answer any questions, welcome you, and even give you a little gift. See, she's a natural. Do you see this? She's a natural. But we did want to let you know about some things that are coming up here at Kensington. And the first thing is this, is next Sunday, July 24th, you may have already seen or heard that this was supposed to be our outdoor service. And unfortunately, Grove's uh, renovation timeline has been a little bit backed up based on what you see happening in the back parking lot back there. And so the service is going to be moved here inside into the auditorium, but everything else about the morning is going to stay the same. So it's going to be a beautiful family service. So if you have kids or students who normally go down to our kids or student programming, they're welcome to come with you into the service next week. We're going to have inflatables outside and games and a full lunch prepared for you. So please plan to come and make a day of it. And part of the service is going to involve baptisms. We're going to be celebrating baptisms together. And so I I was hoping that, Carol, you would be willing to maybe just share with everyone about your baptism because it was not too long ago, and maybe just share what led you to that decision. I'd love to. Thanks. Um, for me, I know they often talk about these little nudges along the way, but for me it wasn't a nudge. It was a great big shove. <laughs> so I had been baptized as a child, and, you know, I always thought that was sufficient. And years ago, as I started my personal faith journey, my walk with Jesus, I still never felt that need or desire to be baptized again. Um, but a few years ago, my husband decided to be baptized, and I was super excited for him. It was all like great, you know, very, very happy about that. And I still thought that was for him, and that was great. Mm -hmm. um, and one day we were sitting in service right up at the top there, and we were talking, we were talking about baptisms, and it was just like, it just hit me. It's like, this is something I need to do. Mm. And so that thought just came upon me, you know, it, it was just like, this is, this is for me. I need to do that. And once I 
you know, spirit spoke to me and put that in my head. I just thought, I'm going with it. Mm -hmm. And so um, we were fortunate enough to, my husband and I were baptized together by Justin and Jenny. Mm -hmm. And apparently there's a picture of it here. Yes, there is. <laughs> but, and we had, we were surrounded by friends and people from our small group. And it was just a, an amazing mm -hmm. experience. And I'm really so glad I did it. Oh. So glad, thank you for sharing. And so if, that, if that's you, if you have been feeling that nudge uh, from God to just publicly say, this is what I'm about and who I wanna follow, I'm gonna follow Jesus, then next week is your opportunity and it's not too late to sign up. You can do that on our website and we will get in touch with you and get everything set up and squared away. But it's gonna be a great celebration day next Sunday, so please plan to be here. Um, the other event we wanna let you know about is the following Wednesday, July 27th, we have a Rock Your Family event happening, and that will be on Wednesday evening at our Troy campus. Our teams will be working together to host a family event that includes dinner and a family-friendly program, and all of Spring Hills day camp equipment will be open for our kids to use, so the climbing wall and the Euro bungee and all those sorts of things. And so if you could use just a great intentional but fun family input, I would certainly invite you to that, and you can also uh, just register online just to make sure that there's enough food for you and your family so they know um, that you're becoming, okay? The reason we share these opportunities with you is because our hope is always to keep putting in front of you the simplest and easiest ways to connect. Our hope is that you feel like you belong, that you are part of this community, and the best way to do that is really to meet and connect with other people. And so one of the other ways that we do that is by serving, by joining a volunteer team. And so Carol serves on the coffee team, and I would just love, will you just share a little bit about what that experience has been like for you? Sure, it's, it's amazing. I absolutely love it. And it is about connection. I know um, oftentimes people will say that, you know, they serve in order to give back, and there's certainly an element of truth to that. You know, I want to make people feel as welcome as I always felt here. But for me, when I'm serving, it's really, I feel so connected to my community, my church community. I feel connected to the staff, to the other volunteers, to all the members who come in and the kids who run up and they can't wait to get their donut with the sprinkles on it. <laughs> so it's really, I just feel so connected to the, to the community. And I also have discovered that the more connected I am, the more connected I want to be. Mm. So when I'm serving and feeling that connection, um, I'm more apt to say yes to other opportunities to, mm. to serve, to participate in, you know, barbecues and, you know, open houses and things. And they're always such good things. So um, it's, it's a great experience. I'm so glad. Thank you. Would you just give her a round of applause for sharing and thank you so much just for your authenticity and sharing about your journey. Um, thank you. If you want to talk to Carol, she is often out in that lobby at the coffee table as well. So she, I'm sure she would be happy to talk more with you about anything that she's mentioned this morning. But uh, as we kind of shift now and transition into the rest of our service, uh, we'll let you know that today we're in the third week of a series called Epic Tales. And today we get the privilege of hearing from our student ministries director, Jackson Prepolek. He'll be sharing with us this morning in just a couple of minutes uh, about the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus, who in my opinion was a man who really felt like he had it all together until he met Jesus and discovered that perhaps there were some things in life that he had been missing out on. So. Have you ever noticed that gold sparkles in the light but it's cold in your head? Have you ever filled your cup thinking it would feel like enough, but it don't last? When you don't even know what you're reaching for, it's the absence that tells you there's something more. You could have it all.
was a win It's turning out to be paper thin It tears you apart A shadow that you thought was alive Won't keep away the monsters at night That haunt your heart oh. When you don't even know tells you there's something more you could have it all you could have the whole world at your feet every little thing you think you need and still feel empty you could have it all you can have the best this life can bring living everybody else's dream and still feel Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Can you give it up one more time for Mackenzie and the worship team? That was amazing. That was beautiful. Uh, and what a great way to start this morning, um, learning that, yeah, even when we still think that we have it all together, we have our cup filled up, we can still feel empty. And that's a perfect uh, example of what we're going to be talking about today as we're talking about Zacchaeus um, and how he felt maybe exactly that way. So as we're jumping into today, my name's Jackson. I am the student ministry director here. And I have been in this role for about a month, but I've been here in student ministries for about five years. So it's been a lot of fun lately. And today, um, yeah, we're jumping into Zacchaeus. But before we get into that, uh, it's been a packed full last month. So jumping into this role in student ministries as the student ministry director, we kicked it off with a Cedar Point trip. So for Breakaway and Edge, we had a lot of fun. We went an entire day, had a blast at Cedar Point. I think I have an awesome picture up here. Brought a lot of friends. It was great. An entire day of rides, amazing. The next week, we jumped and our EDGE ministry went on a Dominican Republic mission trip. So we took a group of 33 team members to the Dominican Republic for a week, got to serve there. Uh, many of you guys helped with our shoe donations that we did in the month of May and helped bring shoes. So we got to bring all of those down with us, and that was amazing. Uh, and throughout the week, what we did was we partnered with a local church plant. So Go Ministries does a lot of church planting. We got to partner with a local church plant and a pastor named Rafaelito, who has been in a new neighborhood for the last couple years, uh, has planted the only church that we we saw in the neighborhood and we got to help him just build his presence in the community and build trust with his neighbors and get to know them and love them well and represent what the kingdom of God is to his community. So we painted houses, we poured cement floors, um, we also got to do like a VBS style field day at the end of the week which was a lot of fun. So we walked around the whole neighborhood with Rafaelito, gathered all the kids, there was like 70 or 80 kids and then we did a field day. So we did skits like Bible skits with them, gave them messages, we did like crayon drawings with them and water balloon tosses and dance parties 
parties in the street. It was a lot, a lot of fun. Um, so if you see any of our students that were on that trip, please ask them, because not only were we able to do a lot of good work, but also our students were transformed as well. And so I want you to ask them about that if you see anybody from our trip that was a part of it. Uh, after that trip, uh, I got home, and then the next day, uh, my wife and I decided uh, to go and celebrate our one-year anniversary weekend. Um, and so we went to Mackinac for a couple days camping, and then we went to Lake Michigan. So yeah, we got to celebrate. That was amazing. Um, and that was, yeah, a long weekend. It was a lot of fun. We're super glad we did it. By the end of it, we were absolutely exhausted. I had spent one night in my bed in like two weeks, and so we were excited to be back home and celebrate the 4th of July with a bunch of family. So a month into this job, it has been absolutely amazing. I'm so thankful, and it has been very, very busy. Um, luckily, the last couple weeks, I've been able to slow down a bit, jump into my life rhythm, and now I am here with you all today. Uh, really excited to be here. But before we jump into the rest of the day, really quick, I want to receive our offering. Um, so if you call Kensington home, um, this is your moment to shine. If you are a guest, uh, we do not want you to feel any pressure in this moment. But all of those things that I just shared with you that our student ministry gets to do, uh, whether it's Cedar Point trips or Dominican Republic trips, or we actually have our middle school camp coming up in a couple weeks, that's going to be a lot of fun. All of these things are only possible because of your generosity. So first off, I just want to thank you uh, as our community, as uh, members of our church. You are so generous, and you are the only reason we are able to do any of these things. You are the only reason we are able to bless Rafaelito and the ministry that we got to do in Dominican Republic, all because of your generosity. So uh, all the ways to give are on screen. I don't think I need to read these all off to you, so uh, you can check that out. And if you want to give, please do. Thank you so much for that. All right, today we are going to be talking about grace. The topic of grace. Now, grace can be a very churchy word sometimes, um, but also, I, as I was preparing for this, I recognized that we actually use grace in everyday language a lot more than I thought. Like, when I was thinking about the word grace, I was like, ah, oh, it's a really churchy word. Like, how do, I, how do I get there with our community? But then I realized we use this word a lot in our everyday language. Like, we use it to mean kind or courteous. Um, like, if someone uh, cut you off in traffic, I'm sure you were super gracious to them, right, when they cut you off. No, I'm just kidding. But you know when you're merging into traffic and somebody else lets you in, and you're like, oh, thank you so much, you give them a wave, you know, and if, if you don't give the wave, here's your, give the wave, okay, please. <laughs> if somebody lets you in traffic, give the wave, right? Uh, but it's like a thanks because they were gracious to you, right? We use it in everyday language like that. We also use it to mean forgiving or merciful or compassionate. Like, man, it was so gracious of that cop to let me off for speeding, right? Or a judge gave a lenient ruling in the courtroom. Like, we use gracious in our everyday language often to talk about being forgiving or merciful. And oftentimes, we have these biblical words or words that start in the Bible. We bring them into everyday language, and they completely lose its meaning. Well, luckily, grace actually keeps its meaning. So the way that we understand it in our English language is the exact same way that the Hebrew and biblical authors understood it in their language. And so the first time we see it pop up in the Bible is in the book of Exodus, very early on in the Bible, the second book of the Bible, and God is actually explaining his own character to Moses, and he describes it saying he is compassionate and gracious, he's slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. So in God's own description of who he is to Moses, he says he is gracious, and in this definition of gracious, it really means to be seen with favor. So similar to how we use it in English, being merciful and forgiving and loving, it's to be seen with favor. And this is a really common word used throughout all of the Bible. We obviously see it early on in Exodus. It's used over 40 times in the book of Psalm alone, mostly as people cry out for God, asking for God to show them favor, right? Whether they're in exile, they're in hunger, they're being hunted by other people, they're crying out to God, asking for God to show his favor on them. And then we also see this, this word pop up later in the New Testament as well. In fact, Paul gives us probably one of the most common uses of the word grace, the most common verse that we're going to look at right now so we can understand what the ultimate grace is. So Paul describes grace this way. We'll put it on screen. It's in Ephesians. It says, For it is by the grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. See, grace here is a gift of God, something that we can't earn on our own. This is getting looked favorably upon, right? Something we don't earn, but God is offering us this grace. And here he's talking about the act of what Jesus did on the cross being the ultimate grace that we can have through faith. Now, I want to know, have any of you guys ever been shown a moment of grace before? Maybe it was somebody letting you into traffic or something as, as, as simple as that, but also in other ways. For me, I am the youngest sibling. I have two older siblings. Uh, any other youngest siblings in here? 
All right, my people, my people, thank you. Okay, so you will understand this. If you're the youngest sibling, uh, you were most likely shown lots of favor, right? At least your siblings were like, you were shown the most favor. You were probably babied. You were probably given the most things. Definitely not me, but every other youngest sibling um, was definitely shown the most favor. No, it was probably true about me also. I like to deny it. It was probably true. But when I was growing up, I always thought my oldest brother was given the most favor. Like, by far. He was the first one to be able to have sleepovers. He was the first one to get video games. He was the first one, obviously, to drive. The first one to do anything in our house. He also owned the TV pretty much all the time that he was home, right? So he had favor, at least in my eyes. And I also just think good things happen to him a lot. Um, maybe not all the time, but I, I think good things happen to him all the time. And my favorite moment of, of him receiving these, like, undeserved gifts, like, just grace that he did not deserve whatsoever— is uh, this one time we were flying home from New Zealand. Uh, I was in New Zealand for a few months doing mission work, and my siblings came out to visit uh, before I got to come home. And so they came, and we just did like a mini vacation for a week before I came home. So that was great. Vacation was awesome. We start flying home. We're on the same flight together. Um, and my brother starts chatting it up with this flight attendant. And I'm kind of confused. He knows the guy's name. Obviously, he has it on his name badge, but you usually don't just like start calling somebody by their name. Anyways, so he's talking to him. The flight attendant's super kind to him back, almost like he knows him. I'm really confused. Then the flight attendant apologizes to us that he can't upgrade us to first class or like any like economy plus or anything like that. I'm very confused. So I'm sitting next to my sister. We look at each other. We have no idea what's going on. My brother looks kind of confused, but like plays it off really well. And so the flight attendant apologizes. He can't upgrade us to first class. Comes back, brings us a bottle of champagne, is super apologetic, and then brings us back more blankets. He walks away, and I'm looking at my brother like, what is going on? My brother has no idea. So my brother was like, he was just our flight attendant when we flew down here. He was a super nice guy, really cool. So I remembered him, and so I just said hi, and now he's like just giving us all these things. So we had no idea what was happening, but it was really cool. So the rest of the flight, this is an 11-hour flight, we got first class food. I still remember we had duck confit at like two in the morning. It was the most amazing dinner ever. I don't know why I remember that. But we had that. We had blankets, uh, like ma as many blankets as we wanted. I think we each had two blankets. Uh, we got like as many snacks as we wanted. He checked in on us all the time. With every meal, he kept offering us champagne. I, it was, I was very confused. Anyways, we get to the end of the flight. I think we land in America. We're taxiing. And the flight attendant comes up to my brother and he's like, hey, I'm really sorry. I know you work for the airline, but I just can't remember your name. Like, who are you again? <laughs> and my brother's like, dude, I don't work for the airline. You were just our flight attendant on our last flight there, and you were super cool, so I just wanted to say hi. And the dude thought it was so funny. Like, he laughed. He thought it was great. He thought it was just like a fun story. And then as we're walking off the plane, hands us like a full-size bottle of champagne. All the other ones, like the mini ones that you get on planes. He literally tries to like give us more gifts. Like, it was absurd. He, he played it really well, but it was very funny. And things like this happen to my brother, I think, a lot. Now, he probably thinks things like that happen to me a lot, because that's how it works. But I think these things happen a lot. And that is the perfect example of an undeserved gift, right? That is being seen favorably. Now, he did not deserve any of those things, but boy, was he seen favorably. And of course, the flight attendant didn't realize that we didn't deserve the gifts. Uh, but even once he did realize we didn't deserve the gifts, he kept giving us more gifts. But like every gift that we can receive, things that we receive, it requires one thing of us. Every gift requires one thing of us. It's that it must be received, right? For you to get a gift, the only act you have to do is to receive. And so as we're about to see, uh, people often respond in two different ways to the grace that God offers us. So if grace is what God's offering us as an undeserved gift to be seen favorably upon, there are two different ways that we often see people respond. And so we're going to look at these two different people that are going to represent our two different ways that we often respond to the grace of God. So Jesus sets these up in the book of Luke. It's, we're going to be in Luke 18 and 19 today. Obviously the story of Zacchaeus we already kind of mentioned, and then also the story of the rich young ruler we're going to jump into and see what it looks like um, to respond to grace. Now as we're reading these two stories of these two different people, I want you to be thinking about which one am I similar to? Which one do, do I have a tendency to fall into that trap? Which one resonates with you more? Because I'm kind of curious, as you, as you read through this, do you resonate with either of these two people? Because I have a feeling every single person in this room will resonate with one of the two people. So we're going to jump into Luke 19. We'll be looking at the story of Zacchaeus first. Uh, so it starts in verse 1. We'll pick up the story. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. 
So Jesus was headed to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. So he's going through Jericho. He's still like another 20 miles out, I think, about from Jerusalem. And in Jericho was this man named Zacchaeus. So Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector. Now, at this time in history, the Romans had occupation over the Jewish territory, so the Jews had to pay taxes to the Romans. Now, the way the Romans would receive their taxes is they would set up tax collectors throughout the Jewish community, throughout the regions, to receive their taxes. But the interesting thing was almost all the tax collectors were Jewish people. So they would recruit Jewish people to collect their taxes for them. So these Jews would take taxes from their own people. But not only that, is they would often add a little extra on top of that tax, pocket it themselves, and make a little bit extra money. So tax collectors, not the most liked people in the Jewish community. They cheated their own people by taking their money. They were traitors to their own people by helping out the Romans who were occupying them at the time, and they didn't really like the Romans that much. And so we have this man named Zacchaeus who we're introduced to as the chief tax collector. This man was most likely the most hated man in his neighborhood, in his village, in his region, because he was a tax collector and he was head of all the tax collectors. And that also made him a very wealthy person. So he's not very well liked. So we're going to continue the story. Verse 3. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd, so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him. Since Jesus was coming that way, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But but Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, Here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Now, I can imagine this crowd is starting to gather. This is toward the end of Jesus' ministry, and so he's very popular at this point. The crowds are starting to gather. Zacchaeus thinking, I can't see over all these people. I'm short. I'm going to go run and climb this tree. So he goes ahead, climbs the tree, and just as Zacchaeus is trying to see Jesus, Jesus in this moment is trying to see Zacchaeus. So Jesus calls Zacchaeus down from the tree, says, hey, Zacchaeus, I'm coming over to your place tonight. You're hosting me. And I can imagine the crowd being like, what is going on? Jesus just picked the person we all hate the most. It's very obvious. They all know who this man is. None of them like him. Why did Jesus just pick this person to say, hey, I'm coming over? He could have picked anybody to go over to their house. Maybe somebody more well-liked that would want to throw a party and everyone would want to be there. No, he chose this person in full display of everybody. And I can imagine nobody understanding why. But it's because Jesus said at the end of the story, the reason he came to earth was to seek and save the lost. That's the exact reason why he came to this earth. Another way that Jesus describes it earlier in the book of Luke, he says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but it's the sick who need a doctor. That is why Jesus came and picked Zacchaeus. So Zacchaeus' transformation was dramatic. We see his response in the story. He confessed he had taken advantage of people and perpetuated an unjust system, right? His immediate response to Jesus calling him was to give everything back, was to right the wrongs that he made. So as he meets Jesus, he wants to get rid of the wealth that he had made illegally from his community and give it back to them. He knew that he was taking advantage of people and perpetuating this unjust system, and he wanted to right that wrong. He knew before he could go further into this relationship with Jesus, he had to acknowledge his wrongs and make them right. He had to give back what he had taken and restore those relationships. But Jesus' response in that moment was that salvation came to Zacchaeus. But the thing that we need to understand is, and and what is so powerful, I think, right here, is that we need to understand Zacchaeus' salvation didn't come because he gave all of his wealth back. It wasn't like Jesus saw, hey, he gave all his money back. All right, now you have salvation. That's amazing. His salvation came because Jesus called him to himself. And in response to the grace that Jesus offered him in that moment, in response to that grace, he decides to reconcile the wrongs that he had done, to reconcile himself to Jesus and to reconcile himself to others as well. So Jesus' grace is what transformed him first, and then this resulted in a transformation of his character and his behavior. So the moment Jesus called him, he came down, he was reconciled with God, and having been already reconciled with Jesus right there in that moment, Zacchaeus is now compelled to reconcile with others. So if we choose to receive God's grace, it has the power to transform our life. It's the the first truth for us today. 
If we choose to receive God's grace, it has the power to transform our life. Zacchaeus is now starting to experience the kingdom of God in that moment. He now sees what the kingdom of God is like. It's not about looking out for our own selves and getting all these things for ourselves, but it's about restoring our relationship back to God and back with others. So just as Jesus saw Zacchaeus, he sees you and me, right? Zacchaeus was known as the worst of the worst in his community. He was known as the chief tax collector, the person everyone hated the most, the person everyone viewed as the furthest from God, the most undeserving of grace. Yet Jesus saw him, recognized he deserves grace, just like he sees you and me saying we deserve grace. Now maybe today, when you look at your life, when we look at our lives, we can't imagine how could God accept us, how could God love us? If God knows everything that I do, how could he still love me? Maybe we feel we've done too many terrible things, we've hurt too many people, and as a result, we're beyond the reaches of God's grace. Maybe that's you today in your seat. I mean, can you imagine what Zacchaeus might have thought about himself? If his entire community thought he was not deserving of grace. In fact, tax collectors weren't, weren't welcome to worship in the synagogue, which was the center of the Jewish community. So his entire community believed he was not within grace. He did not deserve grace. He was too far from it. Can you imagine what he might have thought about himself at times? And maybe that's some of us here today. But the extraordinary nature about God's grace, the reason it's God looking favorably upon us, is because it's not based on what we've done or what we will do in the future, no matter how amazing or terrible, terrible those things may be. But it's solely based on what Jesus has already done for us on the cross. That's what grace is about. And as a result, no one is beyond the reach of God's grace. Early on in my faith, um, kind of right after, a few months after, I was all in on my faith. I had a moment where I decided I am going to follow Jesus full force. About three months later, I fell back into a couple sins that I wanted to get rid of in my life, and for seven months couldn't talk to God, couldn't pray to God. I still showed up to some worship services. I was still around friends that had great relationships with God, still had conversations. Other people would pray around me, but I just couldn't do it. For seven months, I couldn't talk to God because I couldn't forgive myself. So if I couldn't forgive myself, how could God forgive me? And I couldn't reach out to him. I viewed myself the way I believe Zacchaeus could have in many moments. See, I didn't want to go to God because I felt I would feel more guilt and shame in going to him than I would just suppressing it down. And maybe you view God the same way I did in those moments. Maybe because of how you grew up or maybe the way that people have represented God in your life, I'm not sure, but maybe you believe that if you go to God, he's going to keep more guilt and more shame on you. But if this is you today, I want to tell you that Jesus loves you, he accepts you, he is reaching out, waiting for you to grab a hold. And if you continue on the path that you're on, he is still going to love you, he is still going to accept you, and he is still reaching out his arm, waiting for you to accept his grace. See, he wants you to experience the life that he created us to live. He wants you to experience the life the same way he wanted Zacchaeus to experience the life that he had for him. Which is why grace calls us down from the tree, extends his arm out, waiting for us. Uh, extending grace to us, extending a grace that will transform our life. So if we choose to receive God's grace, just like Zacchaeus, it has the power to transform our life. So that's one response we have to the grace that God offers us, right? So there's one response. Maybe that's some of you. Maybe you resonate with that. Maybe you don't resonate with that as much. All right, there's still another really common response we have to grace. It doesn't always look like that. So here's the other story we're going to look at, is the rich young ruler. So right before this, in, in Luke 18, so just before this story, is the story of this rich young ruler. And this rich young ruler comes to Jesus. He reaches out to Jesus and says, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds, well, have you kept the Ten Commandments? How have you been doing with those? The rich young ruler responds, I've kept all of these my entire life. I've been doing great. I'm doing awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm doing the whole thing, you know? I'm Check, got it. We're good. And Jesus responds, there is still one thing you haven't done. And we're actually going to read this right now in Luke 18. Verses 22 to 23 says, When Jesus heard his answer, that he had done all the commandments, he, he said, There is still one thing you haven't done. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. 
But when the man heard this, he became very sad, for he was very rich. So this young man came up to Jesus one day and asked him, what must I do to receive eternal life? And instantly in that moment, Jesus knew he does not understand the kingdom of God. He does not understand why I'm here. Now, he's not the only person to not understand why Jesus was there back then and even today. But he did not understand. Jesus knew that. So Jesus responds, asking him, hey, have you kept the Ten Commandments? He's like, yep, got it, we're good. But the problem with the rich young ruler was that he wasn't looking for grace. He wasn't looking for Jesus to save him from anything. He wasn't looking for Jesus to look favorably upon him. He was already looking favorably upon himself. He already had everything done, right? Hey, I've been keeping the Ten Commandments. I'm good. I've acquired all this wealth. Like, I'm doing great in life. So Jesus tells him to go and sell everything he owns and give it to the poor. Jesus was trying to get him to a place of surrender. Was trying to reveal to him, these are the things that's blocking you from realizing that you need grace. For him, it was his possessions and his money. Jesus was telling him he needed to humble himself and remove this barrier that was his money and possessions, which is a common theme throughout the Bible, which is a good warning to us. But this rich young ruler, the story ends with him walking away sad. It does not end the same way we see with Zacchaeus. See, Zacchaeus was also wealthy. He was also somewhat of a ruler in his area. But this story ends very differently. He walks away sad. And I believe it's because he cared more about exalting himself, more about keeping his wealthy status than receiving the grace of God, than humbling himself. Now, maybe you resonate a bit more with this story. I don't think anybody likes to admit it sometimes, because often we believe what will get us into right standing with God is our good morals and good behavior. How many times have we said, oh, once I get things right, I'll go to church, or once I get things right, I'll pray to God. I know I said that. Once I can get things right, I'll be good. Or if you have things right right now, you think you're good, right? Life is good. You think, I'm not a murderer, I'm not a thief. I go to church, I serve, I give my money, I help others, I look out for others. Like, I got this whole thing taken care of. But it's that, if that's what you're thinking, then we're much like the rich young ruler. We do not understand what grace truly is. Because as we learned earlier from Paul, grace is an undeserved gift that we cannot earn for ourselves, no matter what we do. See, grace has nothing to do with what we've done and everything to do with what Jesus has done. So which person do you have a tendency to be like? And I'm really curious, I might even ask some of you guys out in the lobby afterwards, so be thinking about this. But which tendency do you fall into? Do you have a tendency to be like the rich young ruler? Do you find yourself not needing God in your life? Like, you're good at life. You can take care of things. You can take care of your family. You can earn money in your job. You can uh, love others well. You can be gracious to those around you. Do you find yourself not needing God? You've got this. You're doing a good job. Or do you find yourself more like Zacchaeus? Now, ultimately, he was able to receive God's grace. But also, everyone was telling him he was unworthy of this grace. And I can imagine at times he felt that way as well. Have you ever felt like you were too far gone from ever receiving forgiveness? Ultimately, though, Zacchaeus was able to receive God's grace, and he allowed it to radically transform him. The really cool thing about scripture is Jesus often gives us these like punchlines or these main points or like, hey, here's what to get out of this. And with these two stories, Jesus actually sets up both of these stories before even telling the stories. And he gives us this punchline uh, in Luke 18, 14. I just want to read this real quick. And it's about a ruler and a tax collector. And then we see a story about a ruler and a tax collector. It's about a Pharisee and a tax collector. And then we see those two stories. And here's what Jesus says. He says, I tell you that this man rather than the other, speaking of the tax collector instead of the ruler, this man rather than the other went home justified before God, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. This right here is the warning and the encouragement for us today. For the rich young ruler, it's the encouragement and warning to humble ourselves, to remove the obstacles that create our own self-righteousness. Oftentimes, we place these own obstacles in front of, our own, in front of ourselves. Right? Why is it harder to fit a camel through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get into heaven? Because it is really hard to let go of that obstacle of money and possessions. And that money and possessions creates self-righteousness. It shows that we can do this. Right? We can do this whole life thing. Like, we got it. 
right? When you get those things, when you get money and possessions, it's easy to be like, I got this life thing figured out. For the rich young ruler, you have to change your perspective to be less about what you're creating and more about what God has already done. Receive the grace that he is offering you. See, the work has already been done. You don't have to work to receive grace, but you do have to receive it and then watch your life be transformed. Now, for the tax collector, the other side of the coin is to climb the tree. Lift your eyes to heaven. Just as Zacchaeus had to go and climb the tree because he wanted to go see Jesus, that's the encouragement for us today. You are never too far from the grace of God. He died for all of us. See, Jesus' parables are littered with invitations of grace. We have the hundred sheep with the shepherd. The one sheep goes astray, and the shepherd leaves the 99 to go after the one. Right? Showing us that he will reach us. We are the one. Each of us here today is the one that Jesus is reaching after. We see the story of the prodigal son, right? Where the son runs away, and the father's waiting for him to come home with his arms outstretched, and he welcomes him, and he celebrates him when he comes home. We are the prodigal sons, right? We see so many opportunities of God offering us his grace, and all we have to do is receive it. But like I mentioned earlier, that is the one step that we have to do, is we have to receive it. We must receive the gift of God's transformative grace daily. It's the main truth for us today. We must receive the gift of God's transformative grace daily. And daily is that last word. That last word we haven't talked about, I think, is the hardest part of it. It's not this right here. See, this right here, for me at least, is kind of easy. It's easy to receive grace when we're in church. We think we're where we're supposed to be. We think we're doing the right things. We feel like, all right, we get, we're, we're in a place where we're supposed to worship God. I can receive grace here. But then every other day of the week can be difficult. See, it's not about just right here. The hardest part for me is doing this daily, doing this every day. The days where I wake up and I feel self-righteous, for me, it's often Sundays, right? I'm on here on a stage giving you guys a message about the Bible. It's really easy to feel self-righteous, right? Days like this, I can feel self-righteous. Days where I have it all together, I'm loving my wife well, I'm loving others well, I'm looking out, I'm giving money to the homeless man on the side of the road. Like, those are the days where I can feel self-righteous. But then there's other days where I wake up maybe on the wrong side of the bed or whatever reason it is, and I'm not loving my wife well, and I'm rude to her, and I'm cutting other people off in traffic, and I'm not looking out for others, but I'm just looking out for myself, right? And on those days, I still need the grace of God that day, right? So I kind of set up this this thought where you should choose which person you might be, but I think if we're all being honest, I know for if I'm being honest, I can be both of these people, sometimes in the same day, likely in the same week, and I can guarantee it in the same month. So for us today, we have to receive God's grace daily and continually be transformed. See, just as I said earlier, right after I was all in for Jesus, three months later, I couldn't even pray to God. But why was that? It was because I received grace once and thought I was good. I didn't, I I received it, right? I got God's grace and I'm good. But then what happens when I fell into the sin that I thought I was done with? Well, I wasn't receiving God's grace anymore. So how could I go back to God? And that's the truth for us today is it's not just a one-time thing. It's a daily thing. And watch how our life will be transformed just as Zacchaeus's was transformed. Watch how your life will be transformed when you receive God's grace daily. So the question is, will you receive God's grace today? Will you receive God's grace tomorrow? Will you do it every day this week? Will you do it going forward? Will you receive God's grace daily? I'm going to pray for us that we will receive God's grace daily. Um, After that, we are going to jump into communion and worship to end our day. So will you guys pray with me? Jesus, may we receive your grace today. God, may we receive your grace tomorrow. Give us the boldness to climb the tree, to look for you, and to open our eyes to heaven. Give us the strength to humble ourselves, to recognize that we cannot earn the kingdom through our own good deeds. It is not about what we are doing, what we have done, but it is about who you are and what you have done on the cross. Lord, open our eyes to reveal that truth. Remind us of that truth each morning as we wake up. Remind us how much we need you in our lives and that it is your grace alone that we can receive your transformation. Lord, we love you so much. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, so we are going to be jumping into communion next. All right, and we're going to do it a little bit differently today than we normally do it. Normally, it's nice and easy. You stay in your seat. The amazing ushers come by and hand it out to you, and you don't have to go anywhere. It's great, right? Today is going to be a little different. 
It's going to be a little bit uncomfortable, most likely, for some of us. What we're doing today is we have four different stations to receive communion. So we have two up front here and two in the middle. We'll have ushers at those stations. And throughout this entire next song, it's going to be more of a reflective song for you instead of a worship and praise song. Uh, A more reflective song, you can, at some point during that song, stand up and boldly go to one of those stations to receive your communion. You can come back to your seats with the little cups of the, the juice and the wafer and receive communion when you're ready. And this moment for our community, as a reminder of what communion is, it's a remembrance of what Jesus has done on the cross. It is his body broken for us. It is his blood shed for us. This is God's grace offered to us. This communion right here is the perfect example of God offering us grace, offering his own body, and for us in remembrance to receive that. So this is a literal practice today of us receiving God's grace. But you have to receive it. You have to boldly stand up and go and take it. So we're going to be doing that right now. Um, And throughout the entire next song, I encourage you to boldly stand up, go, take the communion, bring it back to your seats, and receive the body and blood of Christ.
Wow. Can you give it up for the team that just led us through that? It was absolutely stunning. You know, uh, as, I'm, as I'm thinking through what Jackson led us through, this, this idea that we need to receive grace daily, I, as I was thinking about which person I find myself, I, I can easily go uh, one day be a person who, who struggles to do that, right? It, having all the expectations in my heart of what I need to do to receive God's grace. And yet it goes back to the very beginning of our day. The kingdom is simple. That his love, his grace is available for you today, every day. And when we lean into that, we experience a whole new vision for our lives, whole new value, and we move differently into people's lives. It is so transformative, the grace of God. Would you join me in thanking Jackson in leading us through that today? Absolutely. I'll tell you this, parents, uh, what a gift to have Jackson and his team. Uh, he hates that I'm doing this, by the way, but his team leading through the next generation of middle school and high schoolers and inviting them to experience what they're experiencing. It is, it is one of the most beautiful things our church gets to be a part of because it's not just a next generation, it's a now generation. I'm sitting up here watching Ainsley leading us in worship today. Sorry, I, my apologies. Uh, but I remember going to camp. NTS, your freshman year, and your journey of growing in your relationship with God to then be here leading us in song. It's one of the most beautiful things we get to be a part of. This is the kingdom and the community when we come together. Amen? All right. So we hope you'll join us coming together next Sunday as well uh, for baptisms and lunch together in a beautiful day of celebration. And again, if you're new or visiting or just not feeling connected, please stop by the hub today after the service. My friends Craig and Kathy, I know would love to meet you. So thank you. For All right. We'll in. see you next week. week. Barbecue fun. Let's hang out. All right. Have a great week, y'all.